Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. Trust that many of you had a, a good Christmas. Uh, it's neat to see uh, family members, extended family members here, your children home from college, other family visiting, and uh, it's a fun season, a fun time to be together. And uh, I, I just like to, on behalf of all of the pastors, um, just thank you for your gift. Uh, we are just in, in awe of your generosity and love for us as a staff, um, and this church just continues to, uh, to be special, and so thank you for that. Um, it was a very, very kind gift. And uh, speaking of gifts, I'm sure some of you had a lot of fun uh, opening gifts, giving gifts. Uh, I tend to be one that I really like giving gifts and planning to give gifts. It's fun for me uh, this, this Christmas uh, I kind of organized with my siblings to get my dad a gift, and, and so that we just kind of had fun preparing. And uh, now that I, I'm a parent with, with young toddlers and uh, having Christmas morning and watching them opening up gifts, uh, you know, buying them a toothbrush and, they, and putting it in wrapping paper, they think it's like the greatest thing ever. If you come home from Walmart with it, they're like, well, I don't want another toothbrush, but if you wrap it, they like it. Um, so it, it's a lot of fun just getting to experience gift giving. And... Um, one of my favorite gift-giving moments uh, this holiday season was our, our small group had uh, an, an, a Christmas night where we had this uh, Christmas party where we had an elephant swap. And I don't know if you've ever done an elephant swap, but basically the premise of it is you find something in your house that you want to get rid of, and you wrap it and you give it to other people so it's their problem. And uh, so we had some, some good moments, and uh, my favorite moment in, in that swap was uh, Greg Smith got the number one, so he gets to pick first. He was all excited, gets his pick of the litter, so he goes for the biggest box there, figuring, oh, that's going to be the best present, and opens it up, and what is it? It's a bunch of old purses. It was, gr- it was great. Oh, it was perfect for Greg. So uh, just ask him, you know, it, how, how his purses are working out, and uh, actually, I think he gave them to my wife. I, I may, may be wrong. Uh, but this Christmas, uh, my wife, uh, one of my, my great gifts that she gave me and she felt was a need uh, was socks. And uh, she got me these nice black wool socks. And uh, I, I didn't really see the need, you know. I was like, I've got socks now, you know. And she's like, no, those things are old and rotten and, and holy. And I said, look, honey, the, the, the socks are fine. As long as my toes don't poke through the holes or my heel doesn't come all the way out through the bottom, they're, they're fine. They're still usable. So I didn't really fully appreciate these socks, and I haven't washed them to put them on yet or tried them out, but, but hopefully I will. And uh, I think sometimes that's the way we are with the gifts that God gives us, is God has given us these amazing gifts, gift of salvation, and today we're going to talk about God's gift of community. And sometimes we receive this gift, and we're like, oh, okay, yeah, thanks, and we don't really see the need for it or understand the, the vastness of the use of the gift. God is a giver, and to be a giver is a good thing. You see, the more you give, the more joy you have, and that's why no one is more joyful than God. No one is more joyful than God because he has given us great, great gifts. God loves to give. We don't have to beg God to give. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God loves to give. Our God loves, loves, loves to give. And the more you get to know the God who gives, the more you become like the God who gives. One of God's greatest gifts to us is the church. The church. An intentionally designed community. We often miss out on the fullness of this gift. I think sometimes our typical American church experience is flawed. What do I mean by this? Well, I think that we miss out on experiencing the relational, intrapersonal, supernatural church life the way that the New Testament describes it. I remember one of my favorite messages recently was Pastor Woogie talking about church life, and he referred to Acts chapter 2. And the early church was in each other's homes, breaking bread together. I love that portrayal of the church, sharing life together. We all love Pastor Tally's statement he makes on a regular basis. I'm a mess. You're a mess. We're all a mess. We all have problems, personal problems, marriage problems, 
parenting problems, self-identity problems, financial problems, career problems, loneliness, addictions, phobias, weaknesses. And I wonder if sometimes we're failing to find peace and resolution amidst these problems we face because we have this lone ranger mentality. Our mindset is to fix ourselves and maintain a cultural public image. God has gifted us a community so that we would not face our problems alone. And for many Christians in America, corporate church life is a Sunday morning worship service, and that's all. Some also attend some kind of uh, class or perhaps a Sunday morning uh, Sunday school or a Wednesday evening class in which there is very little intentional interp- uh, interpersonal re- ministry. And, and don't misunderstand me. I, I believe in the tremendous value of corporate worship. I believe in solid teaching and that these times of teaching are crucial for our growth in depth and our development of strength in the Word of God. You simply cannot read the New Testament, though, in search of what church life is supposed to, and walk away thinking, I'm just going to go to Sunday morning service, and that's church. That's all church is. That's not what the sum total of church is. It's not just one service. You come to sit for an hour, hear a message, and then you're off on your merry way. Calvary Bible Church has a vision statement that was built years ago before my time here, and I love this statement. Our vision statement is that we are building a committed, worshiping community that knows the Word of God, grows in the knowledge and application of the Word of God, and shows the Word of God through service and evangelism. A worshiping community. We are a community. We're not just a service. We're not just one service. We are a community. Community is something so much more. My aim this morning is to encourage you to experience the fullness of the supernatural church life as the New Testament pictures it. This morning, I want to encourage us to explore the wonders of what God's community was designed to be and for us as a body to examine our own personal lives in such a way that would make us consider if a lifestyle change is in order. Let's go before the Lord in prayer before we dive into his word this morning. Father, we are so thankful that you love us. That we spent this last week celebrating the fulfillment of your promise that you would indeed send a Messiah. That he would save us, redeem us to yourself, that we may have a relationship with you. This morning, Lord, I pray that you would Help us to understand your word as we dig through it. That we would see the value in your intentionally designed community, the church. That we'd see the benefit of being a part of it and serving it. Lord, we thank you for your word. Continue to give us minds to understand it and hearts that are teachable and moldable to heed its wisdom. We pray this in your name. Amen. So, God's gift of community. Well, let's start off in, in Ephesians 4. And we're going to read through verses uh, 1 through 16, and uh, just, to, just to get some larger context, but we're really going to start off in verse 7. But let's start in verse 1 and, and read through the first 16 verses together. Follow along as I read. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying, he ascended, what does it mean 
but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that builds itself up in love. So the first thing I want us to think about this morning is that the gift of community is rooted in Jesus' gift of salvation. Take a look at seven, verse 7 with me. But the grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Each one of you have been offered the gift of salvation. Paul has spent the first portion of this book laying out the doctrine of salvation. He's laid out positional truth. Just read through chapter 2 and 3 and you'll see the richness of the love of God for a people who were once his enemies, dead in our trespasses, now made alive through what Christ accomplished on the cross. And so he begins to lay that out before he spends the next portion of the book dealing with some of the practical truths for us to spend uh, applying in our lives. But before we can understand how to apply these practical truths, we must understand that these positional truths, the truth of who Jesus is and what he accomplished, is indeed what the practical truths come out of. We grow out of what Christ has accomplished and into who Christ is. Take a look through this text again with me. You'll see that Christ is mentioned throughout this function of the, of the church. Verse 12b, the second portion of it, right? For building up of the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. So this is rooted in Jesus. 13, again, read there. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And again in 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Again, Jesus is mentioned over and over and over again because this community is rooted in what Jesus has accomplished. Our positional redemption comes and brings out our practical life change. There is one love, one God, in one way, and that's through Jesus. And we become this single visible community. In this text, Jews and Gentiles now seem to be reconciled through Christ, reconciled in Christ together. Two people from extremely different backgrounds, different philosophical worldviews, religious worldviews, come together under one banner, and that is Jesus. This community here at Calvary Bible Church is rooted under one person, the triune God. Jesus has accomplished that. We're here this morning claiming Jesus. That is the unifying factor that brings us all together. That is the thing that we can say, I too was broken and lost, but now I'm found because Jesus has rescued me. And that's the thing that we all share in common, is that we were broken sinners who needed Jesus, and we claim Jesus, and we boast in nothing else. The gift of community is rooted in Jesus' gift of salvation. When we understand that, it's much easier for us to participate in this community because the community then is about Jesus. It's about glorifying Jesus. It's about making much of him. 
It's not about promoting self. It's not about making yourself known. When our goal as a community is to become more like Jesus, to make him known, to let others know about him, we all share one common goal. Not the goals of many people trying to say, well, I want to accomplish this in my life, and I want to accomplish this in my life. Those are separate. A community that is rooted in Jesus' gift of salvation understands that they have one common denominator, and that is Jesus himself. So he's given us this gift of community out of what Jesus has accomplished. Jesus demonstrated some pretty amazing ways to have community. He came to earth and he spent time with men, teaching men, and equipping men, shaping men. And we're going to see in this text that God has gifted us people in his community for the equipping and building up of the body. Read with me in verse uh, 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. God gives us people as gifts. You need to know that you're a gift. You're a gift to others. You are a gift to our church. And here he's talking about these people have these abilities and these people have these abilities and these people have make these contributions and these people make these contributions. But let me just say this. People just don't have gifts. People are gifts. People just don't have gifts. They are gifts. And if we only think that people have gifts, we use them for their gifts. But if we believe that people are gifts, we love and appreciate the person, not just their function. People are gifts. I want to point that out. God gave the church these people, these apostles, these pastors, these uh, these teachers to equip the saints. That's my job. My job as a pastor is to equip you all, so that you can do the ministry. That's a, a mindset change that some, some people really need to, to turn around. They think that, you know what, the pastor does all the work. Well, we do a lot of the work, but our job ultimately is to train you so that you can do the work. And God has gifted us people who love to study God's word, to know God's word, and to help others know God's word so that they too can live to transform life. Calvary Bible Church words that know, grow, show, right? So we can have people in our church who are mentors. I I remember growing up uh, in Scranton as a young pastor, a young minister. I was so thankful that I had this group of men in my life who mentored me. So I was serving God and I was working full time in ministry, but I had these, these other men who were pastors or some were even uh, just, just laymen who had been studying God's word longer than I had been alive, who were faithful men of God, who came and walked alongside me to equip me to say, here, let me, let me transfer not just helping you develop your character, but my competency. Here are some practical skills you can have. One of my mentors, I remember for one of my birthday presents, he gave me a set of commentaries that he had been using for 10 years, had all different handwritten notes. And so he had spent the last couple years of his preaching and studying writing notes to me in the commentaries, knowing I'm going to give these to him. And I want him to, to notice this and to notice that. He was giving me his competency, all this effort and work that he had done, he had given and transferred to me so he could equip me to help me serve others. God has put people in our church, wise men and leaders in our church to equip you all. We have some great teachers in this church. We have a great Sunday school teaching panel. Just check out any of our Sunday school classes. Men and women who love God's word and study it are ready to equip you. We have an amazing pastoral staff. I mean, I just sit on, on, on Monday mornings sometimes, and I just try to be quiet because it's like I've got these four guys who I'm just like, I just need to learn from, you know? They've just got this wealth of knowledge. I mean, they've lived lives well beyond my even whole lifespan. 
It's, it's amazing that I can sit and just learn from these guys and be equipped from them. And you can too. God has blessed us, has gifted us with people to equip us. Life is hard, right? We talked about all these different problems that we face as individuals. Well, God has gifted us men and women to walk alongside us and to help us. To guide us through these seasons of life that are challenging when we don't have the answers. Some of you are are babes in Christ, new to the Lord. You're not sure how to study the word of God. One of my favorite things is sitting down with some of the guys that I meet with and just working through principles of Bible study. Here's how to study the Bible. I remember one of my mentors said, here's a a passage of four verses. I want you to write out 100 observations. And there was like 30 words. And I'm like, there's 30 words in these verses. How can I come up with 100 observations? Sure enough, he taught me how to do it. Blew me away. So it's just teaching me, equipping me. How do I study? How do I know God's word so that I can live better in my walk? The aim of leaders is to equip all God's people for service. The, the proper translation here, this, this equipment, is, is to prepare or even to, to put right. Our sin has derailed us from a right relationship with God. So we, we don't have this right relationship with God. And so these, these equippers, these men and women who are equipping us, are helping us put right this relationship so that we are restored positionally through Jesus. And now we can practically learn how to engage with God, how, how to interact with Lord, the Lord, how to pray, how to spend time with Him. We can train ourselves and develop all of these things. God has gifted us people in this community for the equipping and building up of the body. Read with me now 14 and, uh, through 15. Well, let's, let's start in 13. We'll, we'll jump back. Until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into uh, him who is the head into Christ. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped when each part... is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. My third point is God designed this gift of uh, community to be one that seeks and speaks the truth in love. God designed this gift of community to be one that seeks and speaks the truth in love. You, You look through these verses and you see, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So we're, we're learning. We're, this is a progress. This is, we're working towards this to mature manhood. Paul uses this language specifically because there's a point in our lives when we're no longer babes, when we become mature in Christ, where we then, too, are able to turn around and be equippers, invest in others. Right? So my parents, as a young man, they were teaching me, and I'm going to school, and I'm learning. And eventually you get to a point where you're a man, right? You grow up as a man, and now you're responsible to, tr- to start a family, raise and train up your children, lead your wife and lead your home. You are equipping them for life and godliness. So spiritual growth all of a sudden comes to a point where that's no longer my focus. My focus now is reproduction, is transferring my competency, is equipping others. And that, that's a, a process that we have to work through. And that's why we need these equippers to help us get to this point because then we become a community that values truth, that we seek and speak the truth in love. So he, he's talking about here, so we no longer be children tossed to and fro by way, the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human Cunning by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So I'll become a truth seeker. I'm a man. I want to know truth, and I'm ready to to seek that truth, to find out what is true. I want to know it, and I want to speak it. I want to share that truth with other people. 
I'm no longer a child who's going to be, oh, this person said this and this person said that. There are lots of things in this world that are vying for your attention or trying to tell you how you should view yourself. Our culture is all about self-promotion. American culture is so narcissistic. And it's all about pride. Just lifting yourself up. And that is a lie straight from the pit of hell in terms of how you should live your life. God tells us to be humble, to serve and love one another, to make much of him, not of self. And so we need to be people who seek out truth and are not swayed by what Satan has set up to to lure us away from God's path. Speaking the truth in love is challenging because it requires us to maintain the walk. Paul talked about this early on in in chapter 4, right? He says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You've been called by Jesus to salvation. So he's given you Positional holiness. We've talked about this in the past. But now, he's calling you, but you need to work towards practical holiness. This is challenging because in verse 3 you see, we're to be humble, gentle, and patient as we communicate truth to one another. And Paul uses this language like humility, gentleness, patience, love, unity, and peace in verses 1 through 5. And then in verse 13 and 16, he uses these words as well. Unity, knowledge, mature, Speaking the truth in love, growing, building, loving. Some of those things are not natural to us, right? Being humble is not natural. We're usually not a patient people. That's why fast food companies thrive, right? (laughs) We don't want to take the time to, to, to cook something. Gentle. We can be pretty abrasive, right? Especially if you get in my way or in the way of my agenda. Man, are we loving? Are we unified underneath that that banner of Jesus Christ? Are we focused on building up truth, knowledge, right, that he talks about? Are Are we intentionally becoming mature? Are we growing, building, loving? If you're in a relationship with Jesus, those things should be coming into existence. That he is the branch and our life is the fruit on on this branch. If we submit ourselves to Jesus, if we are following Jesus, we will treat one another differently and we'll treat one another increasingly like Jesus has treated us. So we've all got some work to do. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us become more like Jesus. And as a church, to treat one another more like Jesus treats us. Frank Gabelin says that the church cannot allow falsehood to go uncorrected, yet truth must always be vindicated in the accents of love. So, as a body, we can grow together in this, in this community, growing and in, in becoming more mature, growing in our walk with the Lord, learning to speak truth to one another in love. And that's challenging, right? Because we need to value truth. We, we don't want lies and deception and and false prophets to come in and tell us things. But at the same time, we're a community which we love one another and we speak truth to one another. So that's kind of challenging, isn't it? So I I think there's some practical things that we can take or glean out of this idea of speaking the truth and love to one another. I, I think the first thing is I can't just come up to somebody I don't know and just smack them around, right? With, verbally with, you know, saying, you're wrong about this, 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 bam, 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 and, and you don't deserve anything. Because they're not going to respond. They're going to be like, who are you to tell me what to do? But if I have a relationship with somebody, if I'm part of a community with them, if I'm loving them and serving them and building up relationships and friendships, it's a lot easier for them to see my life is walking with the Lord, that I love God, that I love his people, and that I'm speaking truth to them because I, I care about them and I have their best interest at hand. I'm able to develop a relationship with them. I remember growing up, my parents were speaking truth to me as a young man, and pff, my parents, so I'm not going to listen to them. What do they know, right? 
But I had another man in our church who had walked alongside me as I was this young, prickly, adolescent, middle schooler. And, you know, the best thing for me would have been somebody to come up and verbally just speak the truth to me and slap me around a little bit. But he understood that I wasn't going to learn or understand what people were speaking to me unless he had this foundation of relationship that he demonstrated that he indeed does care about me. That he had some authority in my life to speak truth into it because he was there. He had walked alongside through hardships with me, had seen me fall and, and get up, had shared in my losses, celebrated in victories. And so then, when he saw sin in my life and he could confront it, man, I was way more receptive. I was so thankful for that relationship because it, it saved me in so many ways from continuing down paths of destruction and making poor choices because I had this man who was speaking truth into my life because he had walked alongside me, sharing life with me. In Scranton, when, uh, when I was working at, at the church that I, I was there, uh, lit, working at there, uh, we had this, this men's group that we met together. And um, informally, formally, we, we had kind of all got together and uh, we liked the same things. We would talk about nerdy sci-fi stuff sometimes. And um, so we'd get together and, and talk about stuff. And then it kind of formed into this, like, hey, man, we, we all love God's word and we love growing together. We're at the church together. Let, let's kind of make this a, a regular thing where we intentionally meet once a week to talk about our walk, to talk about our marriages, to talk about how we're living, talk about our, our relationships with, you know, whether they have kids or, or whatnot. And so there's this group of just five guys, and we would meet, and we would get together all throughout the week too. We all kind of lived on this one stretch in the city uh, of the street, so it's like we could walk to each other's houses. So in the summertime, we'd get together, and we'd just sit outside in the back. Uh, that One of the guys had a fire pit, and we would we'd talk about everything. I mean, some nights we'd sit and we'd talk about theology, and some nights we'd talk about, you know, whether lightsabers were real and could be created. You know, like, he sh it, just, it, it was so all these different conversations. But we had developed this great foundation that we had begun to, uh, speak truth into one another's lives and to identify things. And so one of the guys, uh, you know, he was, loved God, he was a good friend, and, and so all of a sudden he had just kind of made some, some poor decisions, just kind of being lazy. He ended up losing his job, and then uh, he was going to, to uh, grad school, and so he had taken out this loan to go to grad school. So he lost his job, and uh, he couldn't collect unemployment, so he dropped out of school and decided to use all the loan money that he got from grad school just to live off of, which, that's illegal. And so he was just living it up, hanging out. He would, he would go on these road trips with his girlfriend, and they, would, like, they were going to the movies every day. And then he, like, he just kind of like stopped caring about taking care of his, his, his apartment. So it's like, you know, we'd stop by his apartment, and he had, like, I mean, just... just bags and bags of trash that he was just too lazy to take his trash out and uh <laughs> there's this one scary moment when kind of everything kind of came to fruition for us we're like okay we, we need to we need to sit down and talk to him was we had um one of the guys that went to his room and he had a birthday cake that we had given him the year before at his foot of his bed just rotting and so we we're just like okay this guy needs us to speak truth into his life and so we sat down with him and it, guess what it was really uncomfortable. It was challenging. But you know what? We had s spent years developing a friendship with this guy. He knew that we loved him. He knew that we cared about him. And we had to speak hard truth to him and say, dude, you're a sloth. You need to, you need to, to, to man up. You need to get back in school. You need to put your resume together, get a job, stop staying inside playing video games all day, blowing your life away. Man up. God has called you to something more. I mean, this guy was involved in the church. He was a, a, a good communicator, a good speaker, had pursued counseling. I'm sitting there saying, man, how in the world are you going to accomplish any of that if you're doing this? But because we had this foundation, we were able to speak the truth in love. And guess what? That guy's life turned around. It wasn't easy. We, we met with him. And it was tough. You know, there were some awkward moments, but we continued to, to, to share life together. He continued to spend time with us. He was humble and receptive and repentant. And now God is using him greatly. He got married, and 
you know, like, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> he's, like, cleans his house now and does all this stuff, right? And, and now he's, he's, he just finished up uh, his Masters of Divinity. So he, he went to seminary, finished that up, and now he's, he's serving God at a church up in New York. And so, you know, like, it's amazing that these moments that I look back and I'm like, community, sometimes it's really messy. Sometimes it's challenging, but if we're willing to engage in it together, if we're re- willing to recognize this special gift that God has given us, that there is no community like this where you can sit before one another and say, I boast nothing other than Jesus, so I'm able to destroy my pride, to be humble and gentle, willing and receptive to speak truth into one another's lives. So just like we were able to speak truth into this man's life, he spoke truth into our lives. One of the things that my wife Laura knows is that if at any moment in our marriage or in our life together that I start just making stupid decisions and she is confronting me on my sin and saying, this isn't right, you shouldn't be doing this, I know this is wrong, and I'm not receptive to her, we have all sat down as, a, as this group of guys and I said, you have permission to go to these men and they will come and confront me. And they will surround me and help correct me. And she knows that if there's ever a moment that I'm not listening to her wisdom saying, hey, honey, this is sin, that these guys will call me up and say, hey, man, so I'm, I'm disappointed to hear this news, what's going on. They'll confront me, confront my sin, speak the truth in love. They love me. And I know that if I go back to Laura and I'm like, why did you wrap me up? Why did you do this? I'm going to get another phone call <laughs> saying, Hey, why did you uh, berate your wife again, man? You, you know that she's supposed to come to us. So that special community, that special relationship can be formed. And that is so good for us because we're a mess. We need help. We need one another to speak truth in one another's lives. Now, the challenge of that is that we have to do it in love and humility with gentleness, right? There needs to be that foundation that I've demonstrated that I care about you, that I love you. And one of the, the things that we love here at Calvary Bible Church, and Pastor Tally has been plugging these over and over again, we want you to experience this community on a, on a, a more intimate basis. And we've, we've tried to encourage that through small groups. It's not the only avenue, but we want you guys to be spending time with one another, developing these relationships. And you have to be intentional about it. You have to say, I'm willing to open up. To let people see my yuck, my stuff, so that they can see that I'm working and growing through this too. So that the equippers can come alongside you and equip you and say, yep, kill that, continue to do this, grow in this. Here's something you're struggling with. Let me walk alongside you and encourage you. Let me walk alongside you and bear one another's burdens. I think there's some great scripture for us to be able to to see some encouragement that the writer of Hebrew gives us. Turn over now quickly to Hebrews 10, 24. Twenty-four through... Uh, yeah, 24. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue to go into 25. 24 through 25 in chapter 10 of Hebrews. It says, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. It, notice it, what it doesn't say there. Uh, it does not say, Let the pastor consider how to stir you up. One another is what's there, not the pastor. So let one another. So guess what? It's your responsibility to stir one another up. You all are supposed to be working together, stirring one another up to what? Stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, by encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Stir up one another. It's your responsibility to engage in community, to walk alongside one another, to be an encouragement. To say, I intentionally need to be an encouragement to other people. How can I lift them up? It can be a text. It can be a phone call. It can, you know, stop by unannounced. That will really freak New Englanders out, right? <laughs> and just say, hey, I'm here. I'm going to encourage you. How can I do it? What are you doing at my house? Leave me alone. You didn't call. Um, right? 
Find ways that you can intentionally minister to people. I love that when we went through Corinthians, Pastor Tally talked about it's not where can you serve, but who can you serve. That's the same mentality we have with this community. There's so many people here that need to be encouraged. They're, they're going through stuff. There are people in this room right now sitting in seats that they are going through challenges and trials in their lives. They need encouragement. Some of you have gone through trials similar to what they've already got, what they're going through now. And you've come out the other side and you're like, God is good, God is faithful, he'll get you through it. How can I help you get through this? My wife was so encouraged um, by uh, a testimony uh, of someone in her life who reminded her, uh, she, she, was just, she called one, uh, the, her friend up one day and said, I'm going nuts. I've got three children under three in diapers and I'm ready to pull out my hair. I don't know how I'm going to survive. Like, what in the world am I going to do? And, uh, and this, this other mom who was uh, older and empty nester said, you know what? She said, remember this season. Remember what it felt like right now because when you are an empty nester and you have time and your kids are grown up, guess what you can do? You can go and you can help the moms who are going through what you're going through right now so that, they, that they're not alone. Calvary Bible Church, you have ministered to my wife. Many of you have come and encouraged her and said, hey, can I just watch the kids so you can, you know, run to the grocery store or, you know, can, you, you've blessed us greatly. She doesn't feel alone. She's got a, a, just a wonderful amount of women have come and encouraged her. Young moms, you're not alone. We want to help you. We want to walk through this stage with you. That's community. That's identifying needs, stirring one another up to do this. And so Laura was just so encouraged by this woman who reminded her, remember these, Tracy Durant calls them the blur years, because it's just the blur years, like diaper. Oh, another diaper. Okay, you know, like, that's just, that's, your, that's our life right now. But we're so excited that God's going to bless us when the day that when, you know, all you little kids, when you all get married, we're going to be watching your kids for you so that you can have a breather, okay? And I look forward to that because I will appreciate that. Hebrews 3, 12 through 14, I love how Paul words this. He says, take care, brothers, um, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitful, deceitfulness of sin. Every day. So community, coming together as a community, it's not just on Sundays. Every day we are to be functioning as a community. This gift of God's community is that every day. You're not alone. Every day we should be encouraging one another, stirring one another up, speaking in the truth and love. And man, technology has made that easy for us New Englanders, okay? I know we don't like to, you know, step outside our comfort zone, but texting is easy. Guess what? Our phones now, you don't even have to type. There's a little button you can talk and say the text and it will send it to them. It's great. Just encourage them. Let them know you're praying for them. You'd be surprised how uplifting that is. I, I'm so thankful. When, you know, some of the guys in my life, hey, man, I'm praying for you. You know, my, 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 one of my best friends, Dan Lyle, he's a pastor up in Laconia. He'll send me sometimes, hey, man, don't be a knucklehead today. Love you. You know, like, I, I, that was great. I, thanks, I really needed that, you know. So there's, there's, you have these relationships every day. Every day. The gift of community is something that can transform our lives. Because Jesus has given us salvation. And this community can be something where God is glorified. Where God uses this community to transform us continually. To work out some of this uh, sanctification process in us. We need others to be able to speak truth in our lives. And we need to be humble and willing to receive it. So I have three questions that I want to uh, you to ask yourselves in light of God's gift of community this morning. The first question is this. Are you preaching the gospel to yourself that you may be humble, gentle, patient, unified, loving, and at peace? Are you preaching the gospel to yourself? This is important because when we preach the gospel to ourselves, it reminds us that we're broken and that we need Jesus. Sets our mindset to say, I'm a mess. I need Jesus. It's not anything that I'm doing. 
It humbles us. The moment that you put yourself in light of who God is, it puts you in, in, in a proper perspective. We need that daily. Because guess what? We prideful people. We puff ourselves up. We rely on our stuff. We rely on our positions, our power, our authority, our jobs. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves to calibrate our mindset. That this life is not about how much I can get now, how much I can build up here on earth, how many treasures I can get here. But the gospel reminds us that life is about making much of God and serving the people he loves. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord God yourself and love, your, love the Lord God as yourself and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. The gospel reminds us of that. And that launches us into a, a great mindset for how we engage in this gift of community. The second question is how is your equipping relationship going? I want to explain this a little bit. Some of you are equippers. God has taught you a lot. You're in a position where you're equipping. But some of you who are equippers aren't walking with anybody. You're not identifying, hey, I can, I can invest in this person. I can help this person. I equip this person. And some of you, you need an equipper in your life. But you haven't sought one out. We need to be seeking out these relationships, these intentional relationships. And here's the truth Many times when we set up, say, oh, I, w- I want you to, to, to you know, I, I want to I mentor you or someone comes to me, I want you to mentor me. I end up learning just as much from them as they do from me, if not more from them. And, and that's the beauty of community, right, is that we're, we're serving and loving and ministering to one another. But be intentional about your relationships. The Proverbs and Psalms are just, just full of listen to your elders Find people who have walked with the Lord. Ask them questions. What did you do in this scenario? What did you do here? How did you handle this in your life? We're not not willing to ask those questions. We've got this lone ranger mentality. Oh, I can figure it out. What do these old people know? That's a terrible mentality. There's so much wealth and wisdom there. And some of you more mature believers, are you intentionally finding Young believers in their walk and saying, hey, can, I want to intentionally invest in them. You know, maybe don't, don't even tell them. Just say, I'm going to invest in this person. Find that person. Develop that equipping relationship. How is your equipping relationship going? Are you getting equipped? Are you equipping others? That's part of this community. And the third question, are you both a seeker of truth and a lover of people? I remember it, I was a, a Bible college student and uh, the first year of Bible college, you know, I made all kinds of stupid comments because I thought I knew something. And really all, all a year of Bible college does is make you dangerous. <laughs> and so the more and more I, I went into to my education, uh, the more and more I realized that I knew less and less. <laughs> and, you, you know, as your, 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 your mind is broadened. But I'll, I'll never forget coming downstairs, and I was an upperclassman at the time. And there was these two freshmen, and... They were sitting having this argument about eschatology. And it was heated. I mean, it was, it was nasty. It was really, really ugly. And I just kind of sat and listened for a moment and as they're arguing in the lounge. And I made a couple observations. The first observation was that neither of them had a Bible. So they weren't, they weren't digging through God's word saying, what does it say? What does this say? Because that's the source of truth. They weren't seeking out truth. The second thing I noticed was that the conversation wasn't aimed to, the debate wasn't aimed to find out what is truth. The debate was to establish a victor and who was superior. And that is not being a seeker of truth. That wasn't profitable. That was about, that whole debate was about puffing up self. They were not trying to find out what truth was and they were not speaking the truth in love. They would make these snide, educated comments, you know, uh, <laughs> educated insults. Don't, you don't notice them as much, right? But they're there. And, and you're just like, man, I can't believe these guys. They're brothers in Christ, and they're just at each other's throats. Are we a seeker of both truth and a lover of people? So a seeker of truth has to be willing to say, I, 
could be wrong. I'm willing to put my presuppositions aside and to say, I'm a, I might need to be teachable in this moment. I need to submit myself to, to this, to what does this say? So if somebody comes and says, hey, here's some observations I see in your life and here's what God's word says and I don't see them aligning. Be teachable to that. Are you a seeker of truth? Do you want truth? And a lover of people. Some of us, we love truth and we just want people to know truth but we could really care less about what's going on in their lives. We just want them to say, yep, sign here, I believe with all these same things. Okay, go off in your merry way. All that matters is our doctrine and our theology. No, th- these two things go together. Truth leads us to love people because truth says that God loves them. Do you love people? How are you loving people in this community, Calvary Bible Church? How are you intentionally seeking to love one another? Are you seeing the broken, the lonely, the person who is hurting? Are you aiming to love them, to serve them? Again, I think a great way to do that is, is small groups. I'll plug it again. Get in one. Because then you can, you can minister to one another in great ways. Because then you get to know about each other. You get to know what's going on in one another's lives. You're sitting here saying, oh, I don't know everybody. And yeah, we're, we're a big church. Get in a small group. And you get to hear what's going on in people's lives. You have a small people that you can minister to, get to know, and they can serve and love one another. So these three questions. Are you preaching the gospel to yourself daily? How is your equipping relationship going? And are you both a seeker of truth and a lover of people? God has gifted us this great community. Be a part of it. It's exciting. It really is. We get to see some amazing things happen. You know what we get to do next Sunday night? We get to get together as a church and celebrate that God has rescued souls. We're going to witness a baptism. There are going to be a bunch of people getting baptized saying, look what God has done in my life. And we get to join in the celebration. That's why we have a party afterwards. It's because it's, we're celebrating, right? It's food and fellowship. It's a party. We're just excited because God is doing good things. And we want to be a part of that. And we want you to be a part of that too. Some of you, you desperately want community. You desperately want friendship. You want purpose. Well, God has gifted us all of those things. Let us not forget that this new year as we head into it. Be a part of the community. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you that you have indeed gifted us community. That we are not alone. We don't have to face all these trials by ourselves. Lord, there are times when we have not answers, we don't have the wisdom, and you do. And you use people, you use community to communicate that to us. Thank you for the church. Thank you that you've equipped us. That you've put equippers in our midst to to help us to be a body that works together so that we can all be the body of Christ, serving and loving one another. Thank you for truth. Thank you for the truth of your word and that it can shape us and renew us and, and, and show us what is right. Lord, I pray that we would be lovers of the truth, that we would be seekers and speakers of the truth. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to love one another well. Give us a burden for one another, that we would desire desperately to have friendships and relationships here at Calvary Bible Church, that church is not just a service, that it is a daily lifestyle. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.